everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Art Study of You. I am your host, Cameron Gilmore. And this week, we've got a banger for you. Um, let me just give you some back history on my guest this week. Tiffany Slater is a phenomenal HR rep. She's a phenomenal business owner, a mother, um, a wife. But more importantly, her story and how it comes all together is fantastic. Imagine growing up most of your life in a bar, living your life in a bar, conversating with people in your bar, in a bar, and just being able to have these very, very deep and intentional conversations. And I love this because she really goes into a, a great imagery and understanding how you have meaningful conversations. See, as a little kid, that's where she would spend her time. Instead of being out on the streets or running around, it was at a bar with her parents, her parents who owned this. And, and most of them were like, what the heck is a child being at a bar? Well, babysitters, right? I mean, that's what you had to do. But one thing you have to think of and, and listen to as she goes into the story is she learned so much about life. She allowed herself the ability to grow up and, and take hold of having meaningful conversations and having deep conversations with individuals and finding out that a lot of her conversations that she had really uplifted these individuals, really became a spark to them. And only that, it allowed her to give herself permission, permission to talk to people from all walks of life. As you listen, you know, she talked about people from all walks of life, races and colors and creed and religions and, you know, uh, political stuff. It didn't matter. Economical. Doesn't, who cares? She talks about the relationships she still has with some of those that are still alive. And it was because of this growing up in an environment which allowed her to speak and talk and share and discuss, allowed her to become the person that she is today. Oh, man, I cannot wait for you guys to listen to this conversation I had with Tiffany Slater. It is going to, I mean, it's going to be it's impactful. I mean, I've been able to listen to this a couple of times and man, you can see why people love to work with her. And you also get to see why people absolutely respect who she is. And when she says she's going to do something, She's going to do it. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here is my conversation, part one of my conversation with Tiffany Slater on the Arch Study View. Uh, Tiffany Slater, she's the CEO of HR Taylor Made. She has a PhD, entrepreneur, a mother. She's a voice of, um, of the community, and she's a God fearing woman. Tiffany, thank you so much for being part of this project, being part of this episode. If you could take five to seven minutes, to tell us a little bit about who you are. Um, your ambitions in life, where you grew up, but most importantly, um, why? how has your calling inspired millions? Well, Cameron, thank you. I'm really excited to uh, have this conversation with you and to share more about myself and more importantly, more about my business, which is, you know, why I'm here, right? Yeah. Uh, but I am, like you said, the CEO and Senior Human Resources Consultant for HR TaylorMade. And we are the virtual human resources team for small organizations, be it um, professional service-based businesses or nonprofit organizations. And I've been in business for four years. I started my business because I had my dream job and I hated it. And I needed uh, to find joy in human resources again. I've been a human resources professional for over 25 years. Now, Cameron, I know I look 12, mm -hmm. but I am not. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had to do something where I was using the talent that I had. And I decided that um, helping small businesses to have the same type of human resources support that large organizations have would be the best route for me. And it would be something that will allow me to help, in my opinion, the world to be a better place because I truly believe that happy people make the world a better place. And we spend so much time in our jobs every day. It's important that we like who we work with. It's important that we enjoy the work that we do. And so that's why I started HR TaylorMade. 
I also want to create amazing job opportunities for other people as well. So here I am, a mom of two busy boys, a wife of a very busy spouse who's also an entrepreneur, a basketball coach and a golf coach. He, we're just busy. <laughs> so, you know, not unfamiliar to many business owners. Uh, a lot of us have, you know, um, major life things happening. I have parents that are old, they're aging and I'm mm. helping them with that. And um, it's just a lot, you know, going on. But again, it is not just a Tiffany thing. That is life for many of us. Um, so that's me in a, in a, you know, it's a, a quick rundown of where I am right now and who I am. And you give a shout out to my biggest sponsor warrior energy drink the reason why we partner together is because we have the same mindset with the same drive we're we're for the people we're about the people look warrior energy drink has zero sugar options and they got water as well low calories great taste very affordable no crash big energy fast high in b vitamins awesome awesome design culture design 160 milligrams of caffeine other energy drinks have way, way too much, and they're always giving it back to their community. They're paying it forward. Partner with them. Guys, click the link below. Go, go get yourself your own Warrior Energy Drink and go crush today. Oh, I love it. Love it. Okay, I, want, I, I need you to, to expand on something because you said something very key that a lot of people that listen to this, right, they find themselves in this quagmire of, of I like where I'm at, but I hate what I do. Or I hate what I do, but I like where I'm at. You said something key at the very beginning. You said, um, you like, you love what you do, but you hate your dream job that you found. What do you mean by that? Please, please bring us into that. What do you mean by you hate the dream job, but you love what you do? Yeah. So I said, I found my dream job and I hated it. So <laughs> essentially... I had um, worked in this particular industry for for um, 10 years and I had in my mind, okay, that's the job that I want to retire from. That's mm. the job that I want, that I want to retire from. And I got the job and it was nothing like I had expected it to be. Um, so the people were wonderful, but the the job itself was just it was awful for me. And so it, I just had, it, it just didn't work for me. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. Mm. Guys, listen, and how long were you at that job? How long were you at that, that dream job of yours? For three years. Guys, listen to what she's saying. Well, let me ask you this before I get into this, because how, so you had that, you left three years. Did you start your own company yes. after? Yes. Oh, I did. I did. What? It was Wait, hold you know, on, Tiffany, you can't, you can't, you can't be this insane, <laughs> right? You can't be because you had, you've been in this, you, you've been working for 10, then you moved 10 years, then you went to a job that you were only there for three years. I mean, what about your retirement? What about your 401k? What about your IR, your, your, your Roths? What about, what about all the stuff that you saved? Because now you start your own business. I mean, I mean unless you found the money tree. You had to dip into that. What, so, what, what caused that change? Well, you know, quite honestly, Cameron, it was, it was a faith walk for me. Um, so I was in the job and I was stressed and I didn't know it um, because I was internalizing the stress and didn't realize that it was eating me alive. I literally had gotten to a point where I needed surgery um, my doctor found, um, nodules on my thyroid and they had to remove it because they had to find out if it was cancerous while I was healing from that. My doctor called another doctor called me and said, Hey, we've got to do another surgery. We've got to do surgery on you on a completely different part of my body. And they found growth and they didn't, they were like, we've got to take this out because we don't know what it is. And so being out for, I guess, three months, I don't exactly remember, maybe three months from work and um, healing. And I'm grateful that no cancer was found. And it also confirmed that that was stress eating me alive. And while I was out, I decided, okay, God, 
whatever is next for me, I need you to help me figure that out. I want to follow the path that you lay down. I want you to put the breadcrumbs down. I will be obedient. And he did. And I will never forget, I quit on November 5th, 2018. I gave my job seven months notice. That's how serious I was. Um, I knew that it was time for me to go. And like I said, Cameron, my husband is an entrepreneur and his business at that point had not begun to turn a profit. I knew that I had to go. And taking it just a step further, um, if you couldn't tell, I am sh extremely spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, my husband is too. My last day on my job was June 30th, 2019. He got a contract that was going to start on July 1st. <laughs> hey everybody, I wanna take this quick second here. A lot of you asked me what journal do I use, my family use, simple, this journal right here. See, my buddy Craig Smith has spent years and years developing a journal that takes everything that's up in here and puts it on paper so we can be edified and grow. So if you don't know what to write about, which oftentimes happens, he gives you ideas. And if you want power statements, things that say, I am this, he gives you those ideas. Now, if when you look at on one page, it says, this is what I'm accomplished. This is what I am statements. And there's a quote every single day that you get to write on and, and focus on. The second page is write your daily thoughts, get it out of your head, put it on paper to be the best version of yourself. The link's down below. Listen, I get no money for this. It's just, I believe in this journal. I love this journal. It's changed my life, my family's life. And if you want, it'll change your life as well. Stop and it. That was two weeks, two weeks before my last day, he got that contract. Stop I'm, it. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I <laughs> it was a face, this, it, being an entrepreneur for anybody is a faith walk, whether you are having faith in yourself or faith in God or, or whoever your higher power is to lead you through and help you uh, get to your version of success. It's a faith walk. Mm -hmm. I just so happened to walk in my office every day and look at a saying that says, let your faith be bigger than your fear. And every day I make sure that that is the way that I operate. So there is a young lady that I follow. I can't think of her name, but she says it all the time. Do it scared. And I'm telling you, I do it scared every single day. Stop it. Hey, look, you can't you can't say that on this show because people are gonna be like, nah, that, that doesn't happen. You can't say yeah, that I'm I'm quitting on this day. Like you put it out in the universe. I've given you some you seven months notice. And on this specific day, I is my last day. Whatever mm -hmm. comes, it doesn't matter. Whatever trials come, whatever fear comes, whatever I can't do comes, I am quitting on this day. You made that yeah. you made that covenant between you. You made it between God. You made it between your probably your husband and your children said, I am leaving. I have to. Yeah. Her husband was like, probably if I just hearing the conversation was like probably something like, well, wait a minute. Like what well, my job is not look, it's it's in, we're in the we're in the red. Red is dead. Yeah. We, I don't have anything. Are you sure? Yes. And then God will get us there. And you're and both were probably like, let's go. Now I listen. I'm not, I'm not dumb. You're probably in, as you get closer and closer to that date, there's probably some conversating back and forth of like, do we really, are we making the right choice? Which is totally fine because you're human to do that. Yeah. But guys, listen to what she's saying. The job she was at, her dream job physically was killing her. Yeah. It physically was breaking her down to be the version of herself that she probably did not like. Yeah. And, it, and it had to be, you had to have surgery you to focus for three months, 90 days. So let me ask you this question. During the time when you were down, or during that time when you had to self-reflect, mm -hmm. give us one or give us two or three principles, actionable items that you were doing to help your mind mm -hmm. align with your future self to arrive to what we are seeing today. Very simple. Um, I let the wind take me where it wanted to take me. And I just followed. Um, for example, I took a creative writing course at the community college, right? Mm -hmm. And um, 
I had never been a writer before, but I had this idea of a book that I wanted to write for children. I'm like, oh, okay, it's a perfect time to do it. I'm just gonna, you know, do it. <laughs> so I did it. Yeah. Then um, I signed up for, uh, what is that called? The speaking uh, group, um, Toastmasters. I signed up for that. I did a couple meetings with them. And then the most important thing for me, I, and this is my, my favorite book, Draw the Circle, which is a 40 day prayer challenge. It gave me the strength to keep forging ahead. It reminded me of God's promise to us. And it just, it just kept it ever present in my mind that Tiffany, this is a faith walk for you. So that book, I've gone through that challenge a good three or four times now because I just read through it and it just, it keeps me focused on God. So that's what I did. Man, guys, that's a, that's a masterclass in itself. Listen to what she's saying. Listen, listen to what the process that she took. She could have just sat on the bed, loathe and complained about a, a surgery. And then you had got to get another surgery on a part of your body that wasn't even originally diagnosed. You could have easily sat there and said, woe is me. What am I doing? Like I'm quitting. I'm giving, I'm giving them seven months notice. My insurance is going to run out. What, what are we going to do? Like, how am I going to become better? And you signed up for a writing course. You signed up for you bought a book. You said, I'm going to write. I'm going to, I'm going to keep my mind sharp. The principle that, that she shared with us is even in the darkest hours, mm -hmm. there is still a glimmer of light. Yeah, absolutely. An unbelievable faith walk to put you where you are today. Cause we only see the 5%. We only really say, Oh, you've been in business for four years. You, you must've weathered COVID He's, you know, COVID because that hit, you know, right. 2019, you've been in business for four years, 2018, 2019, 2020 hits. Oh, now what? Oh yeah. Now what is right? Holy crud. What is right? Right. Unbelievable principle. We, we could stop right now if we wanted to, but we won't because you and me and our, and the listeners, and the viewers of this would be like, what are you doing? That's powerful. So let me ask this question. Would you like to be known as a strong leader or would you like to be known as a strong black woman leader? Mm, that's a great question. I want to be known as a strong leader um, who just happens to be a black woman. I, I, for me, um, leadership transcends color, gender, race, ethnicity, all of those things. Um, yeah, because when you think about leaders, I, I could name several and they fall under every color of the rainbow, every, you know, sexuality and gender and gender identity, all of that. So leadership transcends all of that. Mm. A strong leader. Mm. Mm. Get, so what, what principle would you say defines you as a strong leader, especially look in the, especially in an HR space, yeah. unfortunately, however we want to look at it, right. HR oftentimes is the, the black eye of the company, because you know, when you get a phone call with HR, it's never, Hey, we're increasing your salary. We're giving you a bigger bonus. No, it, oftentimes it's like, hey, um, we got to talk about a few things that you can and can't do or you can and can't say, or, eh, you know, we're going to send you a, a letter. It's your, you know, your this Friday or this week or whatever is your last week with us. Man, yeah. in this space, you have got to have that strong leadership quality. Give us one or one or two, if you want of the leadership qualities that people often say, this is what you are, and I'm grateful for it. Well, one of the things that I think is important for me that I think other people would, would agree with is that I'm very relatable. And um, I've had several different jobs before, but I never felt like I was above anybody. 
I had conversations I would eat lunch with, um, buy lunch for the custodians. I would have conversations with the, the, the people that run the organization as well. So my upbringing um, allowed me to feel comfortable speaking with anybody in any situation. And so that is one of the things that I think is very important for any leader, feeling comfortable meeting people where they are. The other thing that I'm super proud of um, from my leadership perspective is the fact that I always train people to take my job. That's important to me because one, I am helping people grow. And two, I know that when I go on vacation, I can truly be on vacation because there are people that know how to do the work that needs to be done from my office or from my desk. So those are the two things that I'm, I'm really proud of. Okay, I, I I had to control myself because of the last principle that you said. I have preached this for over a decade. I've preached this for a decade. When people ask me what makes me look, I help people take my job. Yeah. I want you to replace me. Yeah. And if you look at your job description, it's this it's this plethora of stuff that you have to accomplish. But if I'm finding people that can take this responsibility and maybe this responsibility, learn how to do these things better, then it relieves me to become creative, be to, to grow, to be better at what I am paid or what I was hired to do, which is X, Y, and Z. So I love that you brought up that point of helping enough people get where they want and you will always have what you want. It's a very powerful principle that's been taught. Yes. Man, that's freaking awesome. Thank you. I'm just going to validate myself real quick. <laughs> Man, I'm going to send this to all those people. <laughs> Just this part. This is your crazy. Look, LinkedIn is the best to send this yes. to because on LinkedIn, they're like, why would you want someone to take your job? Yeah. Okay. Why, why would you do that? Why, why would you want? Why would you want? Why, I'm like, man, no. Why? No, get out of the narrow scope. Yes. Yes. I, I agree with you. I think that that is a, a small way of thinking. I, I believe that a leader's primary job is to grow other leaders. And you can't do that if you keep all of your knowledge inside of yourself. And oh. let's face it, I, there are so many people who believe, well, if I keep all of this, I'll keep my job. No, you won't. Anybody is replaceable. <laughs> Anybody is replaceable. If, if if you were sitting next to me, I would give you the biggest hug right now. <laughs> I would Im I would just hug you and say thank you. Yes. Good night, people. Understand this. Understand this is what you are seeing is somebody who went through the fire, who had to put the faith first, who had to say to herself, I have my dream job, but I hate my dream job. There is something better. I have a bigger calling in life. That look, I'm not, we're not saying that you have to quit your job and start your own business. No, no, not at all. Be, listen to all, go down the principles that she has laid out. She bought lunch for janitors. She bought lunch for people that often are overlooked. She bought, she sat and talked with multiple people because she wanted to hear what their experiences were. More importantly, how she could better be a better servant leader to them. She's telling you that she walked through and is relatable because she's like, I'm stressed. I was stressed. Well, we're not making enough money. We weren't making enough money. Well, I've got kids. I've got kids. Like she has laid out the fundamental principles of what a true, true, true servant leader mindset is. That's that. This part is unbelievable. I still got a few more things I got. We got to get to, but we could stop. We could. Okay, we could keep talking about this. I love leadership. I love Man. all of leadership. <laughs> I just want to rip my shirt off, jump out my second floor window and scream. That is beautiful. Man, that's beautiful. All right. Let me ask you this. You brought this, you said something very key and I want, I, I want to touch on this. You said that you, you have this ability to talk to anybody, your yeah. upbringing. Yeah. Bring us into that space of the upbringing because your parents owned their own lounge, yes. right? First, explain those of us that are listening, right? What a lounge is and what that business was like. Yeah. But at the same time, also, how much time did you spend there? And why did your parents want you to spend time there and not outside? Yeah. 
So a lounge is a bar basically. Um, and my parents owned it, but along with that, and this is something I haven't shared with you, Cameron, but my aunts owned a cosmetology school and a beauty salon. My other aunt owns her own financial um, advisory company. My uncle was an attorney who owned his own law firm. So um, I... <laughs> From a very young age, I had the ability to, not ability, but I was exposed to what was possible. And so being in their lounge or the bar, um, probably, I don't know, three times a week or so, I would sit there and I would feed the jukebox, which was a, a um, I don't know, a record player that you put <laughs> money in. And you yep. <laughs> you know, pick your song. I would just sit there and sing and I would be in heaven. But um, I got to know all the people who, who visited there, all of the, the, the patrons of the lounge, and I would have conversations with them. I mean, they were, they were kid appropriate conversations mm -hmm. in the space, but I got to talk to postmen, police officers, politicians, street walkers, <laughs> Just yeah. and at that time, I probably didn't exactly know what they did or who they were, but they were just all people to me, and they they enjoyed having conversation with me. I mean, I don't know as much as you can enjoy having a conversation with a kid in a bar, <laughs> but, but I never felt uncomfortable. I never felt as though I was bothering anyone or that they didn't want to be bothered. So it gave me the comfortability of having conversations with adults. And that is what I meant about my upbringing, preparing me for having conversations with anybody, because I got to see that everybody at the end of the day, we're just all human. Everybody just wants to have a safe space to smile, laugh, and have a good time, no matter what type of uniform I'm using my quote fingers, mm -hmm. whether it's a suit or a uniform, whatever your uniform is, we all want the same thing. <laughs> Man, okay. <laughs> Let me ask this question. Like there's just it just keeps unraveling, right? It, the, the more we get to know, the more we understand. And we are understanding we are understanding that core belief and principle that you have. Mm -hmm. That's this question. The people that would come into the lounge, were they, were they all different race, color, creed, religious mm -hmm. beliefs? Were they all, all economical, different uh, upbringings and where they were economically in that time? How did conversations with all of these individuals, how did that give you, I would say, permission if you will, to, to have this self-esteem, but more importantly, how did, how did that help you when you're dealing with CEOs and, and corporate leaders of m multiple backgrounds, different race, color, creed, religion, whatever it may be, how did those two things line up with, e with each other from then into now? Yeah. So I, I would definitely say that they were all different. They were definitely different races, um, assuming all different economic backgrounds and upbringings. Obviously, I didn't know them mm -hmm. like that. Um, but that, I think, is a safe assumption. I would say that it it, it definitely allowed me to understand that fundamentally, we all want the same things out of life. Um, just by watching the, the interactions that they would have with each other, regardless of what the other individuals did for a living, a lot of them played on the same softball team together. A lot of them worked together. Uh, they would come in from General Motors, <laughs> a ton of them, <laughs> because they would all ride together. Um, some of them were shop stewards. Some of them were just men working on the line, right? Mm -hmm. So it was, it, you just, got to, you I just got to see so many different type of people and they were all friends I mean they were all friends and this was a really popular place in our area um 
so it, it was just, I mean, the local politicians would come in and, and interact with them. And um, still to this day, there are relationships that my mother has as a result of that lounge. Still to this day, there are relationships that I have with people that are still living that were, you know, patrons of the lounge because um, of that family, I guess you could say that that was built right there in, in a, in a bar. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it allowed me to not necessarily, um, I won't say that it impacted my confidence because it, it, it didn't. However, it did help me to feel comfortable having conversation with anyone at any level. <laughs> Look, I, I, I am, I am, I, I, right now, I am a fan boy. That's all I am. Thank I you. am literally just smiling ear to ear because of the principles that you're teaching, guys. Let me, let me help break this down because look, I'm, I, I'm from, I'm from the Navajo Nation Reservation. Right? I grew up my, my, my education is the reservation school. Love it. My, my parents, you know, but we're sometimes I'm a little slow. So what she, what, what Tiffany's helping us understand is if you want your children or you want to be able to, to sell better, or you want to be able to communicate with better, you have to go and you have to talk to anybody and everybody. You have to put yourself in a position to where you can be relatable. Nobody cares. Nobody cares how much, you know, until they know how much you care. Mm -hmm. Tiffany was able to uncover all of this fitting in a lounge, sitting with people from all race, religion, creed, ecosystems, all of that. And she probably was just asking very basic questions. Oh, what do you do? How do you have fun? Well, that's interesting. What is? And she allowed them to peel back everything, everything. All the walls probably came down and like, hey, you're a kid. All right, yeah, I can talk. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that she had multiple people always say, man, you, 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 carry, you have very good conversation. The language in which you say, the words, the verbiage, how you form sentences together is not typical. And I think that is so key with, especially for this generation that's coming up, coming out of high school, coming into college, getting into the workspace a better, you want to be better and you want to, you want to demand more money, learn how to speak. Yeah. You want to have a position of leadership, learn how to be empathetic and relatable. You want to start your own business and bring people in, figure out how to be a community server. Yeah. That's what, that is what she has just said up to this point. Leadership 101, she has broke down for us in the most simplistic way. Holy. <laughs> Got to compose myself here. <laughs> this is fantastic. Man, this is awesome. All right. Give us one, give us. I mean, I've, I've kind of rambled a little bit here, but I had to get these points across because it's so key and so, so pertinent, especially, especially for those that are wanting to come into this workforce. We need better, we need better communicators in the workforce, guys. Let, let's just cut it out as it is. Parents, if you want your children to do, my, my, my kids, my high school kids, they all have jobs. You know, you, you're going to work. You're time to make, you have to work and know you got to earn the money. And they're all in the, they're all work in a, in a space where they have to talk and interact with adults. Mm -hmm. And that I think is key. Give me, yeah. give us one or two principles or one or two things that we can do to become more confident in speaking with people. Well, I actually have done a lot of work in this area because many people don't believe it, but I'm an introvert. And as a kid, I was actually really shy. <laughs> I was really shy. Um, but I would say being more comfortable speaking with people for me, what I've done, COVID helped me quite a bit <laughs> because I was on Zoom nonstop. I was like, I could do this all day. I don't have to figure out how to walk up to people and have awkward conversations. I'm just in a box in my house. I can talk, you know? So it really, really helped. But now I've found that when I do go out, 
and um, I'm in a space with people I don't know, I am much more comfortable. So I think one of the things that we have to do, find a way to connect with people that doesn't feel so uncomfortable and keep working that. Then take baby steps. Then work your way up into the, the, the space that is most uncomfortable for you. So that's how it has worked for me. The other thing, always have a wingman. I have a good mm. girlfriend. She's like, Tiffany, I want you to go to this networking event. I'm going to pick you up. And she picked me up. She was like, I know my friend. So I was coming to get you so you wouldn't back out. <laughs> <laughs> she picked me up and she would bring people to me. She was like, Tiffany, I want you to meet so-and-so. She would go and grab somebody else and bring them to me. Have a wingman. And the more you have those conversations, the more comfortable that we will become. I'm going to say we, because I am still not the most comfortable with that. Um, at the more we have those types of positive interactions with other individuals, the more comfortable we'll become with that. And I'll also add, Cameron, I think I've had some uh, a little bit of PTSD because I've had some bad experiences as it relates to meeting people in uh, networking settings. And so that I would say has made me feel a little apprehensive about busting in on conversations and what's the right thing to say. Can I join a group of people I don't know and how do I do that? So I'm still learning. I'm still learning.